I want to spend a bit of time talking more about uh, computational geometry problems here. Yeah. All right. So um, we talked about lines and points, and I want to bring together these two uh, concepts into a problem. It's called lining up in um, the UVA 270 is the problem. So you're given a bunch of points, n of them, and you want to find the biggest subset of points that are collinear. Or in other words, you want to find a line that covers all as many points as possible, right? So how does it? How do you solve this problem? Lining up to your seventy. So you're going to have a bunch of points. Right? If they're all on a line to begin with, then of course you just draw a line and that's it. But of course the problem is they're not always on a line and you have to figure out which line contains the most number of points. So for example here, maybe if I can draw a straight line, this is the best line. Okay, let's, let's imagine that's a straight line. Or maybe not. Now, we know that every line is defined by two points. So one of the things that we can do by brute force, I guess, is to look at all possible n square, or n choose two pairs of points, right? n choose two. And for each pair of points, we can draw the line that defines that, that's defined by those two points. And we can just draw that. And then we can ask for each of the other points, is that point on the line? So we can ask, is this point on the line? No, is this point on the line? Is this point on the line? Is this point on the line? This point, this point, and so on. And there are a number of ways you can check whether something is on a line or not. And one of them, you, uh, if you look at the co-library, there's something called distance to a lot of a point or line. And if the distance is zero, then of course, that means um, it is indeed on the line. But there are other ways you can do that. If you were to do it this way, you have n squared lines to check. And for each line, you need to check every point. So all together, it's n cubed time, which for this problem is not good enough. Okay? So how do we do this instead? How do we do it faster? So you don't. Know, so you know that the best line will go through some point. You don't know which point. So you have to try all of the points as one of the possibilities. So first of all, try all points. So let's imagine that we're trying this one. Okay, we want to make sure that the line contains this point. But a line can a line is defined by two points at least. So which is the other point? Well, we don't know. So we're gonna just try them all, right? We're gonna try this one, for example, and maybe we try this one, and then we try this one, etc. Okay, and you might say, well, how is that different from before? Because you have n points for each point, you try all the other points, so that's n squared already. That's no good. However, if you can sort your points by slope, Okay, so we're gonna look at uh, this line. This is a positive x-axis. And we're gonna sort things by kind of the angle, the rotation that you need, right? And or in other words, you can say this is slope. And if you sort it in increasing slope or increasing angle, if there was a point here, Okay, then the points are going to be labeled like this, uh, order like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, maybe. Okay, now if, for example, that these three points are actually on the same line, then they will have the same angle. And so when you sort them by angle, they actually appear together, right? 
So what you do is that for each of these starting points, you look at all the other points, compute the angle. Okay, you, you, you need to use some trigonometry, I guess. And you can sort things by angle. And sorting takes n log n time. Or in other words, this becomes n squared log n. And then you can sweep through, okay, you can sweep through the points from in counterclockwise order, right? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And anything that will have the same angle will come together. So all the things that are on the same line will be grouped together. Now, some of you that are watching this may say that this is a lie because you may say, well, what about point number three? Three, eight, and nine, and the, cent and the center point looks like they're on the same line, but yet they are not quite the same when you uh, sort it by angle. So that's a little bit of a lie. And what you have to do then is to say, well, you only compute the angle in the top half of the plane. Okay, only in the top half. And if you see an angle that is bigger than 180, you can subtract the 180, and then these two will be sorted over here as well. Okay? And then you would be able to do this in order n square log n time, which is good enough. Now there's one more, one more thing that I lie, or perhaps I should say I told you not to do. When you compute angle, you're gonna use, you're gonna get radians. And most likely, your angles are going to be floating points. And if you're looking to see if angles are exactly the same like these ones, to say that they are on the same line, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So instead of actually computing, let me just clear this. Instead of actually computing the angle, what we're going to do instead, if this is a center point, and this is a particular point that you want to know what is the angle of. Instead of actually doing trigonometry and doing, I don't know, tangents, let's say arc tangents to figure out theta, right? So if you want to use trigonometry, then this is arc tangent of y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1, right? And of course, you also have to worry about the case. What if x1 and x2 are the same and then you're dividing by zero? And in fact, in the C++ library, there's something called arctan2, which basically does the same thing, but it removes the need to divide. Anyway, we don't want to do any of this because we don't want the angle. Angle, it's bad because it's floating point. So instead, what are we gonna do? We're gonna look at the slope, rise, uh, rise over run, and I'm not gonna divide, I'm just gonna say what is rise? Y2 minus Y1, of course. Run is, of course, X2 minus X1. And we can pretend, and I'm gonna say the word pretend, the slope is rise over run. Okay, I say pretend because I don't actually want to do this division. I'm gonna remember these two numbers separately, okay? Now, if you have a slope here, and then you have another point, so x3, y3, and then you have some other slope. So you have, let's call it slope 2 and slope 3. So you have slope 2, which is rise 2 over run 2. And then similarly, you have slope 3, which is rise 3 over run 3. And you want to know how to compare them, right? Because if you're trying to sort slopes, you need to know how to compare them, okay? And these are all integers, right? Because uh, slope, the rise and run are all integers. So instead, you, instead of doing this division, we're gonna just cross multiply. So we're gonna say run two, and then we're gonna times run three. 
And if you do cross multiply, everything's still as integers, everything is exact. And you have to, you do have to worry about whether when you cross multiply by run, are uh, these somehow negative, right? So because if you multiply and you get negative numbers, then this inequality has to flip, right? So you, I'll just say that you have to make sure, okay, that's all I'm gonna say. And you can, you have to flip appropriately if needed. And then you might say, well, okay, when, when is the case where slope fails? Slope fails when you have a vertical line. And vertical line means that rise is, well, perhaps I should say rise is non-zero, but run, it's zero. And if you do a normal slope, try to divide by zero, it's gonna give you a big headache. But it turns out that this formula, in fact, actually would work even if Rise, you have vertical or horizontal line. So in fact, this is a much better way of dealing with this, um, dealing with the angle and sorting by angle. So uh, you should use this instead. Okay, so now let's clear this. We'll go back to the slide and we talk about other problems. Okay. Other kind of geometric objects that you might look at is circles, right? So you hopefully remember that circles, basically you have a center and you have a radius and these are all the points that are of that distance away from the center. And there's a equation of the, of the circle that most of you hopefully know, right? All the points X and Y satisfying this quadratic equation. Now, um, if you want to know whether a point is on a circle, all you have to do is compute the distance to the center of the point and see if it is the radius, right? Again, uh, if everything is integers, you might want to compare it against radius square, and just so you compute distance square and compare to compare to radius square. Another thing that's common that, that you might want to remember about circles is that it's pi. Yeah? You, you often need the constant pi to do various things like computing the area, computing the circumference. And instead of memorizing this to a million digits and type it into a terminal, type it into the source code, it is easier just to say, take the inverse cosine or the arc cosine of minus one. And that will give you, that will give you the um, circle, the, the constant pi, right? A uh, few other facts about circles. It's these things you may or may not know from high school. If somebody gives you three non-collinear points, there's always a unique circle that goes through it. Um, there's code in the library that will compare that. Uh, if you have two circles and you want to know if they intersect, and if so, where, this piece of code, intersect circle, circle, will compare it for you. There are two, there's basically three ways you can intersect. You can intersect by exactly two points. Let me just draw the pictures. How can you, you can have two circles. They can not intersect at all. Okay, so no intersection. Okay, but there's also another way. No, oh, I can spell intersection. There's an also another way that uh, there can be no intersection and that's if one circle is within another. Okay, that does not count as intersection. It could be that there are two intersections. So right here and right here. It can also be exactly one it intersection. So it could be that they just touch Okay, intentionally, and then it, there's only one intersection. All three are possible, depending on the circles you have, and the code will tell you which one is which, okay? And the circles, of course, again, defined by the center and the radius. Many of these problems can be solved by basically solving equations, quadratic equations, and if you look at the code, uh, a lot of it is basically like that. Okay, another problem that uh, uh, on UBA, bounding box. Uh, so you're given three vertices of an n-sided regular polygon, 
find the smallest rectangle that encloses the polygon. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, let me let me actually maybe load up this problem. Where's the actual problem? Instead of, instead of the solutions, here we are. I think. No, no, this is the discussion. I don't want the discussion. I want the actual problem. Okay, let's look at this one. And I can probably find here it is the problem statement. Okay, so each case describes one polygon, starts with an integer n, at most 50, which is the number of vertices in the polygon, and then it's giving you the x and y coordinates, these time real numbers, of three of the vertices. You don't know which one. Okay, and then you are supposed to output one line in the format shown below, given the smallest area, uh, just given the smallest area of a rectangle that can cover all the vertices of the polygon whose sides are parallel to x and y. Okay, so there's actually a lot of good things going on here. You're given three vertices. They don't have to be consecutive vertices in an n-sided polygon, okay, n-sided regular polygon. So you have to figure out a box, the smallest rectangular box that enclosed the polygon, okay? So we need a few facts, actually. The fact that it's not three consecutive and costs a little bit of a problem. So if you look, if you have n equals a four, of course, a regular polygon is a square, okay? Pretend that's a square. Or if n is five, it's a pentagon. Okay, again, pretend that all of these are regular meanings, that all the angles are the same, all the sides are the same, hexagon, and so on. One of the things that you have to know, I suppose, is that in a regular polygon, there's a center in the polygon so that the distance from the center to every single vertex is the same. Now, when have we seen it before? When have we seen before a situation where you have a center and you have the same distance to a bunch of stuff? That's exactly what the definition of circle is. So in other words, the vertices of a regular polygon actually fit inside a circle. Right? Okay, I'm not showing this very nicely, but that's kind of the idea. All of them, all the polygons, vertices, fall in a circle. That's a regular polygon. Okay, so now our goal is to actually figure out what the circle is. But you're given three points. Well, we just said that if you have three points that are non-collinear, you can figure out where the center of the circle is. So that's step one. Okay, so step one is to find the center of the circle and, of course, also the radius of the circle, okay? What's step two? Once you have the radius of the circle and you have one point, pick any point that they gave you, how do you get the rest? Well, you can rotate it by theta degrees where theta is 360 degrees divided by n, right? If you have a five-sided polygon, then you rotate that point about the origin, the origin being the center of the circle, right? by 360 divided by n. And we already talked about last time how you rotate a point. And so you just rotate it all and that's all you need to do for this problem. So the key point actually is to first realize that 
you need to compute the circle. Okay, once you figure out, oh, I guess I didn't completely answer the question, right? It says find the smallest rectangle that works. Well, once you have all the points in the polygon, then you just look at the minimum x and the largest x value, and that will tell you how far to the left and how far to the right you have to go. And you look at the minimum y and maximum y, and that tells you how far up and down you have to go for this rectangle. Now, another problem, another common object is triangle. Right? Triangles, I guess you learned this in high school, lots of different triangles, uh, trigonometry, different inequalities, equalities. All of these you have to know. I guess they can come up anytime. Um, sometimes if you have a polygon, we talked about how you can cut them into triangles and maybe sometimes you can solve the problem for each triangle separately, okay? Um, there are things that you probably have learned in high school but forgotten, sine law, cosine law, Pythagoras, all of those things. The one thing that you probably haven't seen is what is called a Heron's formula. So if you know uh, the length of the three sides of a triangle, it doesn't matter whether it's right angle, obtuse, whatever it is, any triangle, if you know the length of the three sides, the Heron's formula tells you how to compute the area of the triangle. Right? Normally, if you don't have this formula, you have to figure out somehow what is the base, what is the height, and then, of course, you know that the area of a triangle is base times height over two. Right? So that's a little bit, that's the, probably the only thing that uh, we have not seen before. Spheres. Okay, so now we're stepping in three dimensions. So spheres, you have to figure out how you actually talk about well, you know, where is a point on the sphere. And you know, you can talk about x, y, and z, but another way, that certainly the way that we have adopted it on Earth, if you have a sphere, right, if you know the radius, then you have these lines that circles that goes this way and somehow one of them is called longitude the longitude the one that goes up and down and the one that goes this way uh, it's hard for me to draw this but the one that goes the horizontal ones are called latitude and if you know the radius of the circle is a sphere and the longitude and lat uh, latitude is just sort of degrees of rotation from some reference point, right? So for, for us, latitude is basically how far you rotate up or down from the equator, and longitude is how far you rotate east and west from uh, some, some reference point, which is where we have, uh, I think, the uh, UTC time zone zero, right? But anyway, you pick a reference point. And there's X and, you know, you can just say, well, okay, we can just, put the sphere in three dimensional space and give them X, Y, Z coordinate that's also allowed. And now you might say, okay, you know, if you have ever flown on airplanes or you've seen how the maps of how uh, flights go, right? They will say, they will draw a map like this. Actually, let me just erase the whole thing. They might draw a map like this, you know, here's where you are and here's where you want to go. And instead of saying that they fly like this, they don't fly like this. You will see lines like this. We know that the shortest way to go from one place to another is a straight line. So why is it doing this funny shape? And the reason is that on Earth, when you have a sphere, the shortest way to go from one place to another is actually not a straight line because Earth is not flat, as far as we know. Rather, the best way to do it is to look at the circle that goes all around the whole sphere, but passing these two points. This is what's sometimes called a great circle. And following this path is, in fact, the shortest path. Okay, the, to figure out exactly distance and all that stuff, it's in some way very easy with trigonometry, but easy meaning that there's nothing advanced but it's 
the same time kind of complicated. You have to draw the right picture and so on, or you get confused. In any case, you can find all that in the greatcircle.cc code. Okay, one final thing that I want to talk about, one final object is called polygons, right? Polygon is just basically any shape that's enclosed, usually not self-intersecting. And the way that we represent polygons in computers is just a list of points. These list of points are vertices, and we usually give them in counterclockwise order. Okay, so what does that mean? So we'll give, let's imagine that I have this shape. Okay, the vertices are here. These are the x, y points. And I will give them some order. So I will give them in an array. Maybe I give this one first, then next. So I'm using one base. So the six vertices here and an array of six points would define this polygon. Now, remember that even though there's a, this is an array as so it's a linear structure, there is a line connecting six and one. So it kind of goes in circle, even though it's not explicit. Also, if you relabel these num things, maybe instead of like this, maybe you use a different numbering. So maybe you start here at one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, you can start somewhere else. This is exactly the same polygon. Okay. So this is a little bit tricky sometimes because you can have multiple input that it's actually the same thing. So you have to realize that. Uh, this polygon I draw is called convex, oh, sorry, concave. This is a convex polygon. Uh, Go like this. What is concave and convex? Convex means that if I take any two points on the polygon, even if it's on the boundary, I draw a straight line, that line is guaranteed to be completely inside the polygon or, or, or it could be on the boundary, right? On the other hand, the one on the left is not convex because there are some points here I can find a pair of points so that if I draw the line, right, this line does not stay within. So another way to think about it is if you have a convex polygon and you want to install security camera so that, and then let's say you can, it's allowed to spin around, a convex polygon can install a camera anywhere in this polygon and it will be able to see every single point in the, of the polygon as it spins. On the other hand, in a concave polygon, if I were to install my camera right here, there will be some places that it can never see, right? So for example, this point it can never see. Many problems are much easier to do if the polygon is convex. If the polygon is concave, sometimes it's really hard. So for the most part, we will only look at convex uh, polygons. Okay. So how do you know if a polygon is concave or convex? Well, remember that we have this orientation test. We know that if you go from one point to the next point to the next, in three, uh, if you go through three points, is it turning clockwise or counterclockwise? And Basically, all you have to do is check at every single con set of consecutive three vertices, are you always doing clockwise or are you always doing counterclockwise? If sometimes you're doing clockwise and sometimes you're doing counterclockwise, then it's concave. If you're always doing convex and you're always doing, or you're always doing, sorry, if you're always doing clockwise or if you're always doing counterclockwise, then you are convex, right? If you sometimes switch back and forth, then you're concave. Um, now, the only thing that I'm gonna say when you talk about orientation analysis like this is you do have to worry about collinear points and you should ignore them, okay? If it's collinear, then you don't really turn. And of course, you can do this in linear time because you just scan every single vertex in the center. 
Another problem that is common is if I have a polygon, convex, concave, doesn't really matter, and you have another point, is this point inside the polygon or not? And the inside also depends on whether you come boundary to be inside or not. So that depends on your problem, of course. And in the code library, there's something called points poly, which does the, which does the calculation. And there's a flag in there that you can set to say whether boundary should be considered in or not. I just want to kind of very briefly say how does this algorithm work. And I'm going to be not completely precise here because there are some special cases that are a little bit tricky. So you have a polygon and it can even be concave. It doesn't actually matter. And you have a point. So let's put a few different points. Some points are inside, some points are outside. And we want to know whether this polygon, uh, whether each of these points, let me put this a little bit further here. You want to know whether each of these points are inside the polygon or not. And what you do is you just draw a line straight up from each of these points. And when you draw the line straight up, you're going to count how many times does it intersect the boundary of the polygon. It intersects zero times here, it intersects one time, it intersects two times, and one time. And then let's try this one too. It intersects three times. And you can see that if you are outside, either you don't intersect at all, meaning that you never stepped in, or you cross once and, and then again, or if you're here and you cross four times, basically you step in and step out and step in and step out. You'll, if it's even, you will always eventually step out of the, of the um, polygon. Right? In other words, if you read the intersection points from top down, Right, you're going in, you're going in here, and then you never step out. That's the odd case. Here, you go in, step out. Maybe it's a different color. Here, you step in, you don't get out. Here, you step in, get out, step in, get out again. Step in, get out, step in, and you don't get out. And so, basically, if the number of times you cross the polygon is even, that means at the end you're outside, right? If it's some, if the number is odd, then you're inside. Now there are a whole pile of problems that you have to worry about. Okay, so this is what I wrote here. It's kind of correct, but actually I'll clear the whole thing. I'll just draw another picture. Uh, So here's my polygon. Depending on how you count the number of intersection, this point here, it's going to intersect both edges. It's going to intersect this edge and this edge. And if you count it as two intersection, that doesn't work. Right? So you might say, well, okay, that's just one intersection. Okay. Fine. But what if your um how should I do this? That's not what I want. A polygon like this. You have one intersection here. Do you want to count this second one as one or two? If you count it as one, then you, your nut count will be even, and then you say, well, I'm out, because now you have two. But if you count as two, then you're good. So sometimes here, you want to count this as one. Here, you want to count as two. And it actually depends on, I guess, whether that angle is somehow concave or convex. There are other funny situations. 
Okay, what is another situation? Oops, different color. Okay, should this line up? Is this an intersection? And if so, how many? Right? Anyway, all I'm going to say is that all of these things can be taken care of. Um, they require some care, and all of that is in, it's already taken care of in the code library. What I really want to say is, unless you are doing something that's, unless you're really confident with what you're doing, unless you're doing something that's not part of the standard library, you should never try to reinvent the wheel. You should always use, try to reduce your problem to one of the standard routines. Okay, area of polygon, if you have a polygon, we want to know how, what is the size, the area of the polygon. And there's something called a surveyor algorithm that um, it's used, it's linear time, and it will give you a signed area where the area is either positive or negative, positive if the, if the um, vertices of the polygons are listed in counterclockwise order, and positive or negative if it's in clockwise order. And in fact, it's somewhat of a generalization of the orientation test. The orientation test actually tells you whether something is cl clockwise or counterclockwise by computing the area of three points, the triangle that's defined by those three points. But um, roughly, how does this surveyor algorithm work? Okay, I'm, I'm just going to draw a simple polygon here. Okay, if you pretend that you just look this way, okay, you just look from the bottom and to up. Uh, actually, let me move this, move this point a little bit. So we draw this again. Okay, so we have a line that goes from the bottom to each of the vertices. And we look at this in counterclockwise order, so it goes into this way. And we look at, first of all, this edge, and that will give you this trapezoid. You can figure out the area of this trapezoid. Okay, now this is not, of course, the area of the polygon because it includes parts that are outside. And then what do you do? And then you look at this edge. And when you compute the area, you'll get this trapezoid. And then you look at this edge, you'll get this trapezoid. You look at this edge, you'll look at this trapezoid and so on. And then when you go uh, look at this edge, you'll get the area of this big trapezoid. Now, when you're moving from right to left, the green arrows, all the areas of the trapezoid will be of one sign and we'll say that these are positive. When you're moving from left to right, the red arrows, it'll be negative. So what happened is that the areas that are outside the polygon, they are counted by the green, but then they're subtracted by the red. So the net contribution, the dead part, it's zero. Now you raise it, it doesn't work the way that I think it should. And at the end of the day, all you're left is this area, the area that you really want. And that's how the surveyor's algorithm works roughly. Okay, if you don't want to know how it works, that's fine. You can just use what it's in the code library. And the last major topic is called a convex hull. Okay, given a set of endpoints, find the smallest convex polygon that contains those points. It's also the polygon of smallest parameter that contains these points. So the easiest way to visualize this it's to imagine that I have a bunch of 
2D points in the plane. But instead of points, imagine that there are little sticks that are sticking out of the table, of the screen. Okay, there are little sticks. And I'm going to, let me clean this up a bit. I'm going to take a big elastic band around it. Okay. And then what am I going to do? I'm just going to let go. I'm going to let go. It's going to snap. And it's going to snap into here. Okay. That's my convex hull. This is the smallest convex polygon. It's not going to do something like this. That's concave, and it's also, if you think about rubber band, it's not going to snap like this unless you hook it into the inside of that peg. So that's not going to happen. And there are many problems where if you're given a bunch of points, you want to find a convex hull. Once you have the convex hull, it's much easier to deal with because you can rule out certain parts of the, of the polygon. The stuff that are on the inside no longer matters. But if you want to know if things are touching each other somehow, things, it's really dependent on what's on the boundaries. What's in the inside doesn't really matter because if something on the boundary, if, if, you touch the, if you can't touch the inside without touching the outside, if you're doing sort of object intersection. So how do you do this? The standard way that the algorithm that's in, implemented in uh, the code library, it's called Graham scan. And the idea is that you pick an extreme point, either the smallest X value or smallest Y value. So let's imagine it's this one. Oops. It's okay, let me erase that. Let's imagine it's this one. Then again, I'm gonna sort everything by angles. And just like before, we don't really sort things by angle, but whether we use some kind of orientation test so that we can sort things by angle. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the sorting is n log n time. And then we just start adding. We start adding this line. We start adding this line. Actually, let me, how do I do this? Uh, Okay, this, this, let's say this is the collinear. So we start adding lines like this. And we keep doing this. As long as we're turning counterclockwise, we're good. But now, when we try to add six, this is no good. In fact, okay, let me, actually, let me just uh, change this a little bit so it's easier to see what's going on. Now change this to the point here. Okay, so we keep drawing okay, like this. Now we know that five is a problem. Five causes the turn four, five, six to go clockwise. That's no good. So we're going to pretend that five doesn't exist. And We'll do this like this. Okay, we'll skip over five and just connect four to six. But this, if I draw this right, okay, let me draw this a little bit. Let me draw this a little bit better. But from three to four to six, it's still clockwise. So once again, I have to drop four out of the picture and then connect. Three to six, and now we're not going clockwise anymore, so we're fine. Six, seven, it's not clockwise, and so on. And now we have a convex hull. And it turns out that even though you add things and then sometimes you're removing things, you can show that this is linear time because each point can be added and removed at most once as you scan. So this is called Graham scan. And it's n log n time because of the sorting. Now, it turns out that you cannot do any better than n log n. It turns out that this problem, it's completely equivalent to sorting numbers by comparison. It turns out that 
if you can have faster algorithm for sorting, right, you can plug in the Graham scan and have a faster convex L problem or, or algorithm. But it turns out that if you can solve the convex L problem faster than N log N, you can actually turn that into sorting algorithm, which I'm not going to tell you much about. So Graham scan, uh, uh, I guess convex L, it's basically exactly the same complexity sorting. In fact, there, there are versions that basically mimics quick sort, merge sort, and so on. Uh, there's quick hull, there's, and so on and so forth. Anyway, they all have the same complexity, so it doesn't really matter which one you use. And the final thing I want to talk about, it's one of these problems that may be in the set that you choose for the course project, called doors and penguins. So the question is, you're setting up a trade show, and there are two kind of vendors. One uses one type of operating system, and the other one does use the other. Okay, then they'll use red and green. Right, like this, and they have they're given x and y coordinates of where they set up the booth, and because you don't want them to mix, you don't want maybe the red dots don't like to see the green dots, and green dots don't like to see the red dots. You want to know if you can set up a barrier so that basically all the greens are on one side, and all the reds are on the other side, and you want this barrier to be a straight line. So. And you draw a straight line that separates the two groups. And right now I can't because I have a red dot that's inside the green one. And in fact, in this case, you can't. If there's no red dot here, right, then of course you can't. So how do you determine this? The easiest thing to do is actually compute the convex hull of the red points and compute the convex hull of the green points. And if there is a no intersection of the two convex hulls, then you can separate them. And if the two um, two uh, convex poly convex hulls intersect, then in fact there's no way you can separate them. For those of you that are interested in artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all that stuff, this is actually a machine learning classification problem. You have two types of things represented by x y coordinates. Right, and you want to know if you can easily decide, given the new data points, whether it's red or green. And when I say easily, it means just compare to the line and see which side you're on. Right, this is actually a very very simple version of what people call support vector machine. Okay, the actual SVM. Uh, Machinery is much, much more complicated than this, right? It's not just two dimension and so on. And it's not just looking for any line that's separate, but looking for somehow a best line. Uh, but anyway, this is a very basic version of that. So that's about it. Uh, that's all I want to say about this. Of course, there are many more computational geometry algorithms that are much more advanced. But for this course, that is all I will say. Um,